Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, free site. DwyerVIP.com, free site. Also, look us up on Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash Dwyer70905 if you ever want to tip us. Today is Saturday, April the 7th, 2018. It's fight day. Let's talk about some fights. But remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, my philosophy is the same philosophy as Wayne Gretzky's. You miss all the shots you don't take, right? I'm more afraid of not taking risks than I am of losing, right? You want risk, you want volatility. If you're in a room and you've done your homework and everyone else in the room disagrees with you, consider yourself fortunate, right? If you know you're right, the betting odds should be in your favor. So, Jared Hurd against Eris Landy Lara. Let me say this. Jared Hurd, in my opinion, is a skilled size guy. People who've listened to me talk about the heavyweight division have heard me criticize some of the division's bigger fighters, right? Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder. If you want to see what a big man, physically big man for his division, who can fight, who actually has a multiplicity of skills, looks like, then I encourage you to look at Jared Hurd. Right? This guy is a master in the pocket. He's not just relying on his size. He actually has a myriad of boxing skills. Now, he's facing, in my opinion, one of the sport's smartest men. Right? Make no mistake, in my opinion, Arislandi Lara's biggest edge in most of his fights is his knowledge and intelligence. Arislandi Lara is a switch. What that means is we look at his defense. He has great defense, right? But, like Floyd Mayweather, that's only part of his game. In other words, he's a guy who's a jack of all trades, right? Now, what I found with jacks of all trades is that they seem to be unaware of the optics. In other words, the way they think is they see problems, they solve problems, they incorporate the solutions into their games. But I view jacks of all trades as being, let's say, a set of four nines. And the problem is somebody else might not be as multifaceted as them, but might have some skill that's a 10, right? And if the opponent can leverage that skill, they can put the jack of all trades in trouble, right? The way I see this fight going, and it's a pretty evenly matched fight, but the way I see this match going is Hurd has to try to make his size an issue. He cannot allow a boxing match to break out. He cannot allow Arislandi Lara to have room to think and to operate. Right? Lara is the more multi multifaceted fighter. Lara is what I call adaptive reactive. He's going to see what Hurt is doing. He's going to make adjustments. So what Hurd has to do is make his size, which Laura doesn't have. Hurd has to make his 10 the issue in this fight. So I believe Hurd has to be very aggressive, very front foot, like Alfredo Angulo was against Arislandi Laura, right? Angulo, if you don't recall, knocks Laura down twice in that fight. Laura has to dig deep to get the stoppage late in that fight. 
That's the kind of fight Heard is going to have to create here. The bet I'm recommending is Laura to win. Understand, this fight is priced close to even money. I believe Laura is the slight favorite at a minus 125. I like Laura to win, hedged with the under nine and a half rounds at a plus 240. Right? Your real purpose here is to take advantage of the plus 240. In other words, if either guy gets a stoppage before the midway point of the 10th round, right, a nine and a half is nine full rounds and half of the next round. If either guy gets a stoppage before the midway point of the 10th round, you win the bet. If Laura wins the fight by decision or even after the midway point of the 10th round, you win the bet. But understand the risk involved. If Hurd wins by decision or if Hurd wins the fight by stoppage after the midway point of the 10th round, you lose it all. Again, I like Laura to win hedged with the under 9.5 at plus 240, right? Understand, you, the bet doesn't have to be even. You can bet more on Lara to win to even out the risk-reward because you're getting a plus 240 on the under 9.5 rounds. Just keep in mind that Lara was dropped twice by Alfredo and Gulo before the midway point of the 10th round in that fight. Just to understand, as talented as Hurt is, he's fighting a guy who's operating at really genius level, and he's going to have to take the math away, take the options away from Arislandi Lara. So he's going to have to be hyper-aggressive. He's going to have to overpower him early, in my opinion, to win. So again, I like Laura to win. Hedged with the under nine and a half rounds at a plus 240. Let's talk about some other fights. Because in my opinion, there's an interesting play on the undercard. I mentioned Alfredo Angulo. He hasn't fought in a while. Would it surprise you to hear that he's fighting Sergio Mora, who hasn't fought for a while, in an eight-round fight at 168 pounds, where neither guy has much experience, right? 168 pounds. And would it surprise you to learn that Angulo is a plus 400 in this fight? Both guys are rusty. Let me just say this, Morris style, and Morris a stylist, right? Defensive guy, uh, can have his back up against the ropes and can defend himself, understands angles and distance, once beat Vernon Forrest, once knocked down Danny Jacobs, right? But understand, Morris style requires you to be sharp. It requires you to keep track of the punches as they're coming. It requires you to see the guy, right, and read the angles. If you're going to be a defensive genius, you really have to keep your skill sharp. That requires more energy than what Angulo's going to try to do. Seek and destroy. Come forward, throw a lot of punches. Now, understand. Mora has had problems with that kind of fighter in the past. Mora has lost twice to Brian Vera. Think about it. Right? Also, Angulo is a very fast starter. Just ask James Kirkland. Right? Angulo loses that fight, but he starts fast in it. So, in my opinion, this line's preposterous. 
I'll be the casino's Huckleberry here. At four to one odds, and understand, a dollar's a dollar. If you win money on an undercard fight, guess what? You're still able to spend it. Right? You don't need to win money off the main event to turn a profit. Right? A dollar is a dollar. If they're giving me four to one on Alfredo Angulo on an undercard fight, right? To me, that's as good as four to one on any fight. The bet I'm recommending here is I like Angulo at a plus 400. Now, I haven't seen it to win. Understand, I wouldn't touch the fight if it were an even money fight. This is an odds play. You're giving me a fast starter who is going to throw a lot of punches, right? In an eight round fight against a defensively minded opponent who doesn't have a lot of power and doesn't have a lot of experience, neither of them at 168. I'll take my chances here on the underdog, right? I like the risk reward. If you're able to hedge the play, and I haven't seen this being offered, right? You might want to hedge it with whatever the over is. In my opinion, the only way for Mora to win this fight is by decision. I like Angulo at a plus 400. Let's talk about another fight that is simply an odds play. Right? Somebody's going to have to explain to me, and I'm serious about this, how the casino is offering you better than 3 to 1 odds on Caleb Truax, who beat up James DeGale in the Gale's backyard the first time they fought. Now look, longtime subscribers here know that I feel that the Gale is one of the most talented fighters in boxing. I think the Gale has more talent than Caleb Truax. I do, right? Quite frankly, the Gale's one of the best fighters I've seen in, in the last 10 years. Here's the problem though, right? Boxing is rock, paper, scissors. Styles make fights, right? Certain guys beat other guys for whatever reason, right? As I said in my pre-fight video to this fight, Rand Barkley beat Thomas the Hitman Hearns twice. Kirkland Lang beat Roberto Duran, right? Some styles just don't mesh. Now, DeGale is a guy who likes to play changing angles, right? You come at him, he's standing like this. You move an inch, he's standing like that. He's giving you different looks, right? He, you don't know what his dominant hand is. He's great on his front foot. When he needs to be, he can, he can actually be fluid on his back foot, right? He's a boxing multilingualist. He's singular. Not a lot of guys can switch like him in the middle of combinations, right? His footwork, if you're into that kind of thing, is simply dazzling. He'll change his lead foot with the drop of a hat. No question about it. But again, remember what I said earlier. You can have a guy with a multiplicity of skills, right? A bunch of nines and somebody else with a specific strength, who knows how to play to that strength, who has a 10 in their deck. In other words, the rest of their cards don't have to be nines. They can have a 10 and then they can have some fives and some sixes. That 10 guy can win the fight if he can force the issue. If he can get the other fighter to play to his strength. That's what Caleb Truax did the first fight. Let's dig a little deeper into Caleb Truax's background, too. This is a fighter who's in his 30s. This is a fighter who knocked down Jermaine Taylor in the later part of their fight. He didn't surprise Jermaine Taylor. This is after being in the ring 
with Jermaine Taylor, who was an excellent champion, beat Bernard Hopkins twice, right? After being in the ring with Caleb Truax for several rounds, Taylor gets put on the canvas. Understand, Truax also fights Danny Jacobs. Takes that fight into the 12th round. Now, Truax is a former football player, right? Yeah, in researching these fights, we look at a few things. I'm just telling you that I've noticed that football players, whether it's Allen Iverson, you're thinking he's basketball, right? Look at his high school career. Whether it's LeBron James, these football players, whether they're the most skilled guy in the room, right, LeBron James, or whether they're not, they're relentless, right? Gerald Washington, the heavyweight, he's a former football player, right? Now, after Truax loses his football career to an injury, you know, the guy enrolls in the University of Minnesota and goes on to graduate, right? Big part of boxing is mental toughness. Now, I'm not saying Truax is as talented in the abstract as James DeGale is, but what I am saying is Truax is the kind of guy who's never going to give up. You have to beat him, right? He's not buying the hype. This is the kind of guy who you have to do more than discourage. Now you're telling me that he's in against a guy he already beat. Let me point out too, one of the judges had their fight a draw. That's a travesty. That's a travesty. Right? Truax beats the Gale by several rounds. Now I'll agree. Miguel does make a bit of a comeback in the latter part of that fight, right? But I have to tell you, if I were advising Miguel, Truax would be the last person I would have him fight after losing to Truax the first time, right? So, this is one of those fights where, all right, I'm prepared to be wrong, right? I'm taking the guy who I consider to not be the better fighter. But I've got to go with my own two eyes, right? Truax dominated the first fight, dominated it, right? You're going to give me greater than three to one odds on the rematch, and the rematch is in Las Vegas? Sign me up. I'll take Caleb Truax here at plus 300, Right? If you have an opportunity to hedge it, hedge it with the over. But I like the underdog here at these odds. If the fight goes the distance, great. You win regardless of who wins the fight because you have the over. Right? Makes it into the later rounds, great. As long as it's over the over, you're okay. Right? But this is one of those situations where the casino is offering you too much to take the underdog, and in this case, the underdog, let's call him what he really is, the champion, right? The champion is just too experienced, has been in against too many guys, and is just too doggone determined and mentally tough to give up his belt easily. I like Truax at a plus 333. Finally, one more fight I'm going to throw in there because it's an interesting fight. Pretty evenly matched. You might have seen even odds or very close to even odds. Julian Williams against Nathan Gallimore, right? As I look at the film, and I've posted some films of their recent fights in my favorites folder here online, I like Julian Williams, right? I'll agree that Gallimore has a puncher's chance. He does.
But I like Julian Williams to win this fight. I'm not even going to hedge it, simply because the odds don't allow it, right? But Williams, to me, doesn't square up like Nathan Gallimore. Is playing more of an up and down game. Simply put, I think Williams is the more advanced fighter. I like Julian Williams over Nathan Gallimore. I'm surprised that the odds are so even, right? I view this as a casino mispricing, right? Oddly enough, right, I'm taking Williams because I see value in the line. Had Williams been a three to one favorite, then I would have laid off the fight because it would have been properly priced and the risk reward wouldn't have been worth it. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you have any news, in particular injury news or news about whatever questions have been raised about any of the fighters I've mentioned that have impacted the line, uh, and I'm serious when I say I have no idea how Alfredo Angulo is a 4 to 1 underdog, right? If you know why, share it in the comment section to this video, right? Let's make the comment section something that gamblers can look at whether or not they watch the video to kind of get an edge on the casino in these fights. Okay? Thanks for stopping by and good luck at the fights.